How's everybody tonight? Good, good. Good to have you here. Good to have everybody online that's watching tonight. We're glad to have you as well. And we're here as we continue our study in Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open Isaiah chapter 28, we're going to pick up at verse 16. I believe that's where we left off last time. I can't depend on y'all to tell me because I remember one time I skipped a whole chapter and y'all didn't say a word about it. <laughs> y'all didn't particularly like that chapter anyway, did you? <laughs> that was one of them hard chapters. I deliberately skipped it, but I didn't want to say anything. Now, we are always excited to study any part of God's Word. It's, it's not always easy for us because we get into certain things. We say, oh, that one cuts to the core. But isn't that what it's supposed to do? The Word of God, the sword, sharper than a two-edged sword, that cuts through the bone, through the marrow, gets all the way down to the soul where we know it exposes that part of ourselves that God wants to expose so He can cut that out. And then He heals. What a wonderful God we serve. And Father, we thank You for the time we have together tonight. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for our time of singing and worship and song. We pray that we, our hearts will continue, Lord, in worship as we study your word because this truly is a, just another aspect of our worship to you, to study, to meditate upon, to learn, to grow, to understand. And we seek wisdom, we seek knowledge and discernment, Lord, from your word. For we know truly with everything go, that goes around, around us in this world, Lord, your word is the only thing that brings hope and brings knowledge and wisdom and, know, and teaches us how to deal with the things that we deal with in this world. So we thank you for all that you are. We thank you for what you're going to teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you remember in our last study in Isaiah, we saw Isaiah was calling out the leaders of Israel and of Judah of being drunkards. He even called the priests and the prophets drunkards. And they responded to him by mocking him. They were walking in their pride. They were not very accepting of his words. They thought that he was pretty much talking down to them, and they, they said, we no longer need this precept upon precept, line upon line. We, we want deeper words. We want deeper meaning. We want you to teach us something that we don't know, something that's, you know, profound. The truth is, is God's word is profound in the simplest form. The problem is, is that men try to take it beyond what's written so many times, and when they do that, it seems profound, but it's pretty much useless because there's no way to back it up with the Word. And if you can't support any of your teaching with the Word of God, you're already off base. And so we need that foundation. We need that simplicity. And they were thinking they were already above that. In reality, they, like many today, have forgotten the simple truths. And in their intoxicated state, they erred in their judgment. Now this week, we'll see how God will respond to them and to all those who refuse uh, to humble themselves in His sight, as well as those that do accept Him and humble themselves in His sight. So let's pick up at verse 16 in Isaiah 28. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, and uh, therefore tells us because of everything He's told us up to this point, this is His response. He's told them who they are, told, called them out, Isaiah has, and that, now he says, okay, because you've responded mockingly and pridefully, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, whoever believes will not act hastily. Now that's interesting when you first read that verse in response to everything that they've been saying to Isaiah here. Therefore, I'm going to lay a, Zion, a stone in Zion. I'm going to put this cornerstone, a tried and precious cornerstone, the sure foundation. And we know prophetically Isaiah is speaking of Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. What God is saying, and this is so profound <laughs> in its simplicity, is that even when the heart, when the heart of man rejects God, he shows compassion and mercy. Rather than saying, because you've rejected me this way, I'm just going to wipe you all out. 
He said, because you are so drunken and, and, and erred in your ways and you're so messed up in your thinking, I'm going to provide a way for you. I'm going to provide a way. A, a stone, Jesus Christ, the stone, the, the precious cornerstone, sure foundation. In Psalm 118, 22, we see the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So there's two aspects to this. Yes, he's responding in grace. He's responding in mercy, but he's also knowing that they will reject even the chief cornerstone. Speaking to the Jews now, that's who Isaiah is writing to. In 1 Peter 2, 5 through 7 says, You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So it's a double-edged sword. I'm giving you mercy, but you're not going to receive it. So therefore, there will be another other group that he will raise up and offer this to. They will now be open the door to the Gentiles because of the rejection of the Jews. And here in Isaiah, they're told again that this cornerstone will be laid. Jesus himself, their Messiah, is coming. And everything we built be, will be built upon him. All the law and the prophets will be fulfilled in him. And it will be all about faith in him, not about the works of the law. This is, again, if you look at this in context with what Isaiah is saying about the cornerstone, this is the whole picture that we have before us today. This cornerstone is now laid for those who have faith, not of works. It's no longer going to be about fulfilling the law. It's no longer going to be about abiding by this rule and that rule and doing all these things. We now have the fullness of the law fulfilled in Jesus Christ and which is also fulfilled in us to where these law, the, the written law is no longer in effect. It's now written upon our hearts. I will give them a new law, and it will write it upon their hearts. And we now have the history behind us. We see this, this law was fulfilled in Jesus over 2,000 years ago, and they didn't believe. But because of their unbelief, the doors opened to the Gentiles, and the church was born. Romans 9, verses 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of what? Of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So today we have, we have Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is our chief cornerstone, who we're building our lives upon, the church, you, me. We are the church, not the building. We're not talking about the building. We're talking about the church, and the church is built upon Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. But for those who do not believe in him, they trip over him. He causes them to stumble. He's the rock of what? The rock of offense. He offends those who don't believe. And what's the word of the day? I'm offended. Offended, offended, offended. Everybody's offended. They need to get over themselves, but everybody's offended. But when it comes to Christianity... In this country today, or even in around the world, Christianity is the one that all the tolerant people cannot tolerate. Why is that? Because he's the rock of offense. 
He offends every other religion. He offends every other person who doesn't believe. He offends the atheist. He, he, he offends the Islamics. He, he offends the Buddhists, the Hindus. All of them are offended at Jesus, even though most of them recognize that he was alive. He was a prophet, some of them call him. But to go beyond that offends them because they cannot submit to a holy God who sent his son to die for us, and then he's rose, he rose again and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. This is the God that we serve. And for any other belief system out there, whether they claim not to believe or they claim to believe, whatever it is, they are offended by the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he brings offense. Now, does that mean that we go out with the Bible and swing around and offend people by hitting them upside the head with it? No, we don't have to do that. Why? Because the Word of God does its own offending. And we don't have to defend what offends. All we have to do is live it, preach it, study it, meditate upon it, believe it. That's all we're called to do. And as doing that, as we move forward, the offense comes. We need to be prepared to stand in the midst of the offense because the offenses are going to increase the further we go down the line. This is the way it's got to be. The scriptures make it very plain. Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you also. If I offend them, you're going to offend them. And so, as believers, we need to be prepared for the defense coming at us, which will be really an offense against us, but we don't have to defend anything. Even Jesus told his disciples, when you're hauled into court, and they, they threaten you with all these things. Don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit himself will tell you and put the words in your mouth of what you're to speak. That's a relationship with God we need to be seeking. That's the walk we need to have. We're so close to God. We've so, we studied his word. We're so close in walking in the spirit that when something comes our way, we don't immediately go into the flesh and try to defend ourselves or defend what we believe. We just stand and let the Holy Spirit speak through us. And he will do the job. That may not make it easy on us at the moment. Truth still doesn't mean that they're going to receive it. But it means that we don't have to be the ones to defend it. And for the church today, we, make sure, we need to make sure that we're not doing the same thing that Israel and Judah was doing. They were God's chosen people. But yet they were not following God. They were following false gods. They were intermarrying. They were doing all things and everything that God told them not to do. When he took them out of Egypt, he said, don't intermarry. Why? Because these people in these lands are going to call you to their gods. They're going to bring you there. And these wives that you take are going to seduce you into following their gods. And all through history, that's what happened. They were told not to do these things. But we need to make sure that we don't allow our pride to puff us up to where we've forgotten the simplicity of God's Word. It's so easy to take the foundation and start to build, but then you take your eye off the foundation. You start to get off, off center a little bit. And the more off center you get, the more unstable the building is. So you have to go back where? To the foundation. And you need to make sure you're building properly on that foundation. When you come to the point, or anyone comes to the point, to where the precept upon precept and line upon line is no longer needed, the church is in trouble. Look around. The church is in trouble. <laughs> now, I don't mean God's church, His holy church that really believes in Him, because there are many that do. In many denominations, there are many that do. But as a whole, across the country, particularly here in the United States, the foundation has been off-centered. People have drifted from the foundation of the truth. They're building on false sand now. They're no longer looking to the, to the truth of God, and in some cases, they don't want to talk about that because people are wanting more than that. Oh, come in and give us some big, deep philosophical uh, information that we can really walk away and feel good about ourselves with. Well, I ain't got none of that for you tonight. I got the Word, and that's what we're going to stand on. Plans and schemes turn to manipulation and people will come and they're looking for entertainment rather than teaching. But we as the true church need to keep our eyes on Jesus, 
We need to study his word, meditate upon his word, lest we also find ourselves stumbling over the cornerstone of which our lives are supposed to be built upon. And I'll say to this evening that there's nobody immune to the flesh. There's nobody immune to the attacks of the enemy. We're not immune, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. He will not allow things to be put upon us more than we can bear. No temptation is put upon us any more than we can bear. He will give us the strength that we need when we need it. But all of those scriptures are based upon one thing, us keeping our eyes on him. And if we're not doing that, then we're already in trouble because the enemy knows when we're not following Jesus. The enemy knows when we're off, off kilter over here. He knows when we're out of balance over there. And we can find ourselves stumbling just as the Jews did. And think about their history. They came out of Egypt. Oh, they were, hallelujah, look what God's doing. And not and the longer they get on the other side of the Red Sea. Oh, I wish we were back in Egypt. I wish we were back there. At least we knew what to expect. That's really what their problem was. They had no ability to walk in faith, to know that God was going to provide their need. They wanted to see it right in front of them so they could just go get what they wanted when they wanted it. Same mentality that we have today. We want to know it's right there, and we got it, and we're going to grab it, and we're going to take it, and we're going to do it. But if it's not right there, oh, God, why can't I just go grab what I want? Why can't I just have what I want? Because most of the time what we want is not what we need. The word is what we need. The wants tend to fade away when the true need takes, uh, comes into, into sight and we follow that. Now, verses 17 through 22. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters will overflow the hiding place. Excuse me. Your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. From morning by morning it will pass over, and by day and by night, it will be a terror just to understand the report. For the bed is too short to stretch out on, and the covering so narrow that no one can wrap himself in it. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring it to pass, his act, his unusual act. Now therefore do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. Now that's not the first time that we've heard that phrase in Isaiah. In Isaiah. The destruction upon the whole earth. Even upon the whole earth. Now we can sum up these verses simply by saying God's righteous and holy judgment is coming. And he's going to destroy all who do not believe. And this word is not just for Israel and Judah. It's for the whole earth. God's got a plan. He's had a plan from the beginning. And that plan includes his return. It includes the great white throne judgment. It includes he taking who are his with him and the others being cast away. There is but one way of salvation. Only the one door is given. And for those who believe and build their lives upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, they will enter into his eternal rest. And that's a promise. Eternal rest. Hebrews 4, 11 through 13 tells us. I encourage you to go back and read all of the verses before this too. There were so many I, I didn't feel like we could put it in tonight. But... But this is the part I really wanted us to grasp tonight. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Now think about that for a minute. What does it mean to be diligent? It doesn't mean to be passive. It doesn't mean to be callous. It doesn't mean to shy away from. It doesn't mean that we pray a prayer at some point in our life and then go on about our business. 
Diligent means that once we've committed to Jesus Christ, we have to remain focused upon Him. We have to decide. We have to choose. We have to say, I am tempted to go to the past. I am tempted to look at other things. I am tempted to go a different direction. But Jesus is my path. He is my way. And I have to stay focused upon Him. So that's what it means to be diligent. We can't take a break. Satan doesn't rest in his attacks. We can't take a relaxation even, even on vacation. <laughs> you know, most vacations, if you're like us, you're worn out more when you come back than you were when you went. There's so much to do and so much to see. But the truth is, is that we are never to be taking a vacation from God's rest and from the truth of who He is. We have to be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. All the history that we have from the Old Testament about Israel and Judah, all of the history that we have even from the early church up to today, we have to understand that they're given as examples so many examples given, both of what, what, it's, what happens when you follow God and what happens when you don't. It's all there. History that we can grab a hold of. Even our own history, we can tend to forget if we're not careful. And, and cultures around us, the biggest problem that they have is they forget their history. And the next thing you know, they're repeating it. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And there will be an account. Each one of us, even as, even as believers, will face God, and we will face him, and he will say, this is, this is what you did, this is what you didn't do as a believer. And we have to, it's not that we're going to be kicked out of heaven, but we will be judged as, as the church and what we did or what we didn't do. There's an account to be given. Now then you have the other side of that, those who have nothing to bring to the table at all because they didn't accept Jesus as their, as their Savior Lord. Their account is already tallied. Their account is over. It's empty. And they have nowhere to go but to be separated from God. For for those who do not believe, they have an eternity without rest. We're promised rest. And for those of us who are really diligently seeking Him today, we can find that rest today. We can walk in that rest today. But for those who are not, we can't. And many times, even believers are always looking at the rest to come. And they want to rest on the, on the laurels today because they haven't really gone out and, and thought about what it really means for the future. And that's all they're really thinking about. What's going to be like? What's it going to be like? What's going to happen? And am I going to have this rest? And am I going to have this crown? And all these things that they think about, none of that really matters. The crown that we're going to receive is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's the only crown that makes any difference. But he will judge. And for those who, not, who do not believe, they have this eternity without rest. Matthew 13, 31 through 42, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. They will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Interesting here. Today, everybody's offended because of Jesus. In this particular passage here, the angels will gather all that offend him. So you can be offended by him, but it's all you're doing is offending him. And that will come around, and you will be judged for that. Those who practice lawlessness, and, will be, and they will be cast into the furnace of fire, they will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So if you don't believe that there is an afterlife, and that you don't believe that you, there is a hell, then you don't believe what Scripture says because that's what it says right here. They will be cast into the furnace of fire. Now Jude, verses 12 and 13, he's talking about the apostates. He says, These are the spots of your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, 
carried about by the winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars from whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And this, Those who are, some of them are in the church who are no longer believing. They are leading other people astray. And that's where they're going to wind up. The church today needs to be awake. We need to be alert. For this judgment, often called the day of the Lord, is coming. And it's sooner even than we first thought. I mean, again, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. He spoke to the scribes. He spoke to the, to the leaders of Israel and said, you can, you can see the weather and you can read the signs, but you're not seeing the signs of what's happening around you. They missed Jesus, their own Messiah. We today, it's very easy if we're not careful to be pulled into that way of thinking, well, you know, it's... I mean, I don't know. It may be another 1,000 years, maybe another 10,000 years. years. I don't know the timeline. And I will say this, that there have been many prophetical books that have been written, and they've been in error because all they saw was what was going around them. But without putting ourselves into too much risk here, we can look around and see some signs, can't we? Can we not see the, the signs of the times? When we see talk of, one world government more than it's ever been and having a springboard of a pandemic to use to do it with they're still pushing this i mean you can find it it's out there and again as i said sunday i will have a video together soon that that will begin the process of of uh, dissecting some of these things for you guys to take a look at and pass on i encourage you to pass them on to others as as i do that but the thing is, is that we need to be alert and paying attention to what's going on around us. And I don't encourage you to go sit and watch the news because they're not going to tell you the truth. But the truth is here. It's here. We have the truth. We have the word. And we need to be prepared. Psalm 119, 147 through 149. I rise before the dawn of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O oh Lord, revive me according to your justice. Is that not the heart of crying out to be closer to God? That's what being alert means. And I can promise you this, the more time you spend in here and the less time you listen to the news, the more alert you're going to be. Because the Holy Spirit himself will bring you to a place of alertness. And you will hear things. You will see things. And you will know, I need to be praying more. I need to be seeking more. Oh, Lord, I cry for help. My hope is in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may what? Meditate on your word. This is something that we're called to do. We have to do this. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness, O Lord. Revive me according to your justice. And Romans 13, 11, And do this knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of our sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Now I can promise you this, if you read Romans 13, 11, every morning, <laughs> how true is it? It's closer. It was this morning if we read it tomorrow morning. Every day we live, we're closer to the Lord, His return, or us going to Him, one of the two. And there is no escaping death if the Lord does not tarry. And we need to be prepared. Now is the time. It's high time to awake out of our sleep. Now verses 23 through 29. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does a plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he is leveled at surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin. 
but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever, break it with his cartwheel, or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. So when we first read those passages, you say, well, I need to go plant a garden, plant a garden, don't I? I need to go out there and learn how to do this. Well, in these verses, we find hope. We find hope. We find the picture of God's mercy and grace. Using the farmer here as an example, plowing is only for a season. It's only for a time. You don't just keep plowing. You plow it to the point it's ready, and then you sow. And in our lives, God does often plow and uproot hard ground of our hearts. Does He not? I can look back in my life, and even not too, I mean, probably yesterday or today, if I really look hard enough, and see where the plow's been plowing. But in everything that God does when He plows, He doesn't plow forever. He plows to uproot what's there so He can then sow good seed. And the question that we have for ourselves is, are we allowing our hearts to be plowed and softened to be able to receive those seeds? Or are we still hard-hearted and He has to come back and plow some more? God will do what it takes. But to only plow and not sow, there can be no fruit. And God is a God who produces fruit. But in order for us to grow in this fruit, we have to receive those seeds that are sown and let them take root in our hearts. Otherwise, He has to come back and replow and then re-sow. Now, each one of us, by His plan may produce a different crop. You know, he speaks of the cumin, the black cumin. He speaks of the wheat. He speaks of all these things. And each one are sown a different way, and they're harvested a different way. And that's interesting when you think about it, because each one of us, as God plows our hearts, he sows the seeds he wants to sow. First the gospel, we receive that. Then as we mature in him, he sows his plans. He shows his, his wisdom. And each one of us receives what he's sown for us. That doesn't mean we're in disunity with our brothers and sisters that may have different fruit growing because it's all coming from the same source. What we're seeing here is that God then will harvest that fruit differently in different people. And sometimes he has to beat it out of us. But he gets what he wants. He gets it out because he's the one that does it. And there's sometimes you actually have to grind things up. The point I'm making here is that we have to be careful that we let God get the most of his harvest and we don't then take what he's doing in our lives and say, this is what God's doing. This is the seeds that he's sown. This is the fruit that he's harvesting. This is how he's going to harvest. He's going to have to do the same thing in you too. That's how boxes are made. And that's how people are wounded because they're told only God works this way. He only works that way. No, God's bigger than any box we can ever create. And what God, should, what God brings up in each one of us, if it's from Him, it will be for His kingdom. You may be raised as a foot or somebody else is raised as a hand. You may be raised to be a seer. You may be raised to be a hearer. You may be raised to do all of these things. These are the different fruits within the body of Christ. And He sows them. Every one of us are plowed, and some more than others. <laughs> but in His wisdom, God knows exactly how to bring us the harvest. And as I've mentioned before, again, don't compare our ministry or our fruit to somebody else's. In God's sovereignty and God's knowledge, He will bring in the fruit from the whole body of Christ as He seems necessary. For He's God. We're not. And we don't need to ever put ourselves in a place to where we have higher expectations than God has placed upon us. So these scriptures and these verses here are, are wonderful in hope. They're wonderful in hope. And this last part of that last verse, who is, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance, as he guides the farmer and gives him wisdom to plant and sow, he gives the same wisdom in us as he, sow, as he plows, he sows, plants, and we grow he continues to give wisdom to us. He teaches us how to walk in what He's given us. But in every case, the Word of God is the main seed 
that we need to be growing, be growing in. Because whatever God teaches us will be rooted here. Whatever God gives us to do will be rooted in the Word of God. Whatever call you have upon your life will be grounded and founded upon the cornerstone, Jesus Christ and His Word. And there's no other foundation to build upon. There's nothing else that we need to do. We don't need to go out and grandstand. We don't need to go out there and have dreams of grandeur about how we're going to do this and how we're going to do that. And I've heard many people over the years, oh, God's got a big ministry for me. He's got this big plan for me. Well, you're nearing about 60 now. Has it happened yet? A lot of the people aren't doing anything because they're waiting on the big thing. I don't want a big thing. I want whatever God gives us. I want us to walk in that. I want us to, to be obedient to the little things and, and let Him see fit to give us more, if He does, in what He has us to work in. That's where our hearts should be. So, closing tonight, let's make sure that we continue to remain in the foundation of of who we are, the precept upon precept, the line upon line, staying in the ground in the simplicity of His truth, not finding ourselves drifting off, thinking we need more than we need or want more than what God wants to give us because the minute we get over there, we're not hearing from God anymore. Man creeps in and he comes up with these big things, but they're nothing in the eyes of the Lord. So we need to be careful, we need to be awake, we need to be alert, and we need to be prepared. I don't ever want to find myself stumbling over the cornerstone. So, Father, we thank you.